So this is really cool, and hopefully the information I'm about to give you guys is gonna be something that's really exciting, particularly from a Splunk point of view, because I'm gonna stand up here and I'm gonna talk about an anatomy of an attack for a second, but obviously I wanna tie all this back to Splunk and what that can do for you guys from our terrific partner Splunk's perspective. My name is Mark Stanford. I lead a very strange and interesting team called the SIG Incubation Team at Cisco. That's the Secure Internet Gateway Team. And it's an incubation because it's a fairly new technology in terms of what Cisco has been doing from the traditional Umbrella perspective. How many in the room have heard of Umbrella? How many in the room have heard of OpenDNS? That's like almost everybody. So we are, of course, the OpenDNS acquisition that Cisco made. We became Umbrella from an enterprise perspective. And one of the things that we're best known for, of course, is DNS resolution. We are the second largest provider in terms of DNS resolution. We see about 180 billion requests a day. And that's just along the lines of enterprise and consumer, right? The biggest, and I wish I had a prize to give out, but this is too easy of a question anyway. The biggest resolver is who? Google, I heard Google. Google, of course, right? Everybody's laptop goes to Google for their homepage. You probably got your Google DNS set. The big difference between us and them is you're not the product for us, but we won't go into that. Um, Google does great job at resolution. Very, very fast, very robust, but we're all about security and analytics. And that's where we come into this presentation. So I'm gonna say a couple of things that may not be entirely true right now at this point. So we've got our safe harbor statement in terms of roadmap, which I always like to throw up there. Don't make any decisions based on what you're going to buy and what I'm saying. Come and see us at the booth and we can talk more about that. But I always throw this up there because there are a couple of things that I'm gonna show you that aren't quite general availability just yet. Now, how many have heard of FireEye? Mandiant. So I used to work for FireEye. I actually did four years at FireEye, great time. And they have a great IR team called Mandiant that publishes a lot of really, really interesting blogs. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, this is a Cisco guy up there talking about FireEye, there's something wrong. Not to my knowledge, not by my perspective, because for me, security is collaborative. We all have to work together. And the more information I can get from them, the more information I can feed to them, and everything works nice and neat. And we're talking about SIMS here, right? This is correlation and collaboration at its best. So I thought, what the heck, let's take one of my old org's investigations and we'll look at that from an umbrella perspective. Does PandoraSong.com sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, if you read the blogs, particularly around incidents, this one will certainly look interesting to you. And it's because it was attached to a campaign called APT29. Everybody's familiar with the APT labelings and how they see them and all the cute cozy panda bears and stuff that they attach to these attacker groups, really cool t-shirts. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So this actually happened almost a year ago, but the really, really interesting thing about this particular attack was threefold. Number one, it was a Russian hacking group, which I know you guys don't hear nearly enough about these days, right? The Russians are never in the news. They're never doing anything in terms of hacking. The second thing was the verticals targeted. Usually when it comes to APT campaigns, they're looking for very specific attributes and networks. Maybe they're hunting information, maybe they're just trying to seize somebody's bandwidth, right? They want your infrastructure, or perhaps they're trying to sabotage or gather intelligence. There's a, a whole bunch of different reasons why. But in this instance, it was all over the place. Pharmaceuticals, local government, public sector, they went after defense and law firms. There were a couple of interesting stories around the law firms. So it was a very scattershot type attack. And the third and final really interesting thing, at least to me, was the similarities between an attack that had occurred just two years before. So you often hear about reusage of tools, reusage of techniques. Well, this is a live example that shows that some animals just don't change their stripes. The target was different. The vertical was the same. And if I asked you what the vertical was, I'm sure you would all guess that as well, just as you guessed Google. It was thought to be, initially, a phishing attack. So who's heard of Umbrella Investigate, right? Lots of people heard of Umbrella. If you've got Investigate, then I don't have to explain much, but I'm gonna show you guys Investigate in a little bit anyway, so you get a better feel for what it's all about. But when we talk about that 180 billion requests a day, that data is going directly into this tool called Investigate. Now, of course, Cisco's got the Talos organization, Threat Grid, AMP, and all these other tools and functionalities in our portfolio, but all of those are being curated and correlated within this tool that we call Investigate. 
And you can see over to the right, domains, IPs, ASNs, file hashes, all of those things are gathered up into the single pane of glass where we can start to try and figure out based on the artifacts and some of the other components of the attack that we can see, not just who the attacker may be, where he's coming from, what, he, what he's targeting, but what he's going to target next. Because while they're actually executing this attack, they're building the infrastructure for the next attack. And I think that's where a lot of tools sort of stray away from the bigger picture, especially when it comes to threat hunting. If I could tell you where the attacker is going to set up his infrastructure and you can block that today before it's actually being done, that's pretty valuable, right? I mean, why wait? I guess you could. It's up to you. But all of that domain IP intelligence, live graphs and requests, we can show you the traffic. There's something called spike rank that I'll show you that was really interesting when it came to this particular attack that told us that this was a bad thing before anybody really knew it was a bad thing. So from investigate, what do we know about the attack? Well, I mentioned phishing. So phishing emails were sent. They were containing a click tracking URL. And that URL was very likely hijacked. So you can see this jmj.com. I'll show you how we know that in just a second. The co-occurrence model, for those that aren't familiar with investigate, a co-occurrence is what happens right before and right after a domain that you're investigating happens. So some of the investigators, the IR guys out there would know this as A to Z. They may attack, they may know it as the life cycle, right? The attack life cycle. But this is a huge component when you're trying to figure out how something happened and where they might have gone next and how you can deploy rules to not just remediate but make sure that it doesn't happen again. So we saw co-occurrences of particular domains that looked like they could have been springboards, looked like they could have been URIs as an end result, but all around that one particular domain. PandoraSong.com had a co-occurrence to RemotePX.net 100% of the time. So based on what I just told you, if you know that it's something that came right before or right after and it's got a 100% co-occurrence, then you could probably figure out that remotepx.net is either A, a springboard, because you don't necessarily know if it came first or if it came last, but it's either a springboard, a referrer, something that sent you to this final nasty website, or it's where you ended up after you hit a website that redirected you to it. Remotepx.net was tagged as malware on 9.27.18, and remember, the attack itself, if we go back, actually I'll go back a couple. So 11.19 was when the blog was published. 11.9.16, 11.14.18. So 11.14.18 was the last time. We actually pegged this on 9.27.18. So when I talk about what I like to call pre-crime for Minority Report fans, this is what I'm talking about. We actually were able to identify attacker infrastructure. We didn't necessarily know it was APT29. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you guys all, we knew it was Cozy Bear before it was Cozy Bear, because I would expect you to literally hang me and maybe drag me off out into the stage. But we did know it was bad, and we knew it was bad based on the traffic patterns and some of the stuff that was being served by it. We also knew that it was bad because it fit a couple of models, and our algorithm showed us that based on these particular models, Legitimate traffic doesn't look like this stuff looks, all right? Everybody knows the TCP sawtooth, right? That's what you would expect to see from traffic. Funny enough, also in life on the web, that's what traffic from a web perspective looks like. Typical sites have a sawtooth pattern. Peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys as you hit it. You look at Google, which I'll show you, you'll see peaks and valleys, right? It runs off for one minute, comes back the next. What you don't see is a little blip in activity, and then a huge spike, and then no activity at all, and then a little blip and a huge spike. What that typically looks like to me is attacker infrastructure being set up, being tested, being deployed in a campaign, being repurposed, tested, redeployed, up and down. That algorithm that we call spike rank actually identifies 90% of what we see today from a malware perspective. Very, very, sophisticated algorithm, but also highly efficient and effective. So we identified that, and then on 10.15.18, we show that the domain was registered about 30 days prior to the attack. Now, I just got through talking about spike rank, but what's all this, all this stuff? This is all passive DNS info, right? We can show you when it was registered, we can show you who it was registered by, we can show you what else it was used as, but we can show you anything around passive DNS data that you could possibly dream of. 
And you may be thinking, well, that's great, Mark. Why would I pay for that, right? We've got Dig, we've got NS Lookup, we've got a whole bunch of tools and websites out there that can do it for us. But the really interesting thing about the way that this particular attack was looked at from an analytics perspective is best said by one of the three letter agencies that I've worked with, and that is, we've got nine tools that can give us everything that you just showed us. The spike rank, different algorithms you use, natural language processing, this type of stuff, this is all passive DNS data, but it would take us like seven days of those nine tools to put all this picture together. You showed me what we would have gathered in five to seven days in 20 seconds, just scrolling up and down the page. So all of that data combined to give you the bigger picture is what Investigate's all about. And then we look at the command and control activity. Anybody familiar with Threat Grid? Everybody knows sandboxing, right? You may be using any number of different sandboxes. Cuckoo's a big one, FireEye has AX, we have Threat Grid. Threat Grid actually showed hashes for these, and if you can read, it may be a little bit of an eyesore up there, but the antivirus result shows Trojans, PowerShell downloaders, all different kinds of stuff. And you're probably thinking, all right, associated samples, are you saying that you actually saw this malware come from that domain? Because that's typically not how domains work, right? It's not really a domain level intelligence. Where we got this from is a backdoor that communicated to a C2 domain, pandorasong.com, which is what Pandora Song was. It was not the dropper, it was not the springboard it was actually the CNC. So command and control was communicating with pandorasong.com and we saw that communication to that domain. We were able to identify all of the traffic and the infrastructure around that domain. And then we were able to take samples from different, or uh, take hashes from different samples that were dumped in threat grid by our customers that were dumped in other components that we have third party intelligence feeds to and associate that. And we could drill into these and actually show you other network connections that were made, other domains that it called out to. We could show you a high level OS change detail. So for those of you guys that like to do forensics on endpoints, this is like a dream because you don't actually have to install anything. We've already got the sample there for you and you can look at all the registry changes and all the service changes and all that good stuff. So all of this popped up around pandorasong.com once we were figuring out the other components. We very quickly blocked the domain. Shocker, right? So investigate shows that we blocked the domain after the attack on 11.14. The callback was made on TCP 443. Now this is interesting if you use any DNS-based protection because you're like, nah, no, there's no such thing as DNS over SSL. That's true. But there's another component of our solution, the umbrella solution, that A, can actually crack open SSL, but the bonus question is, do we need to crack open SSL when doing this type of stuff? And this is why domain-based protection is so effective. We don't care. The domain's not encrypted. The domain's plain text. We can get all the information we need straight from the DNS request and never have to actually tear open anything. So when you think about that first level of defense, DNS is the way. Always has been, we've always used that intel, but now we're really starting to block based on DNS as well. So we're able to block the callback just based on the DNS query, didn't matter that it was over TCP 443, associated it with command and control, and remember I mentioned that little blip? That's what it looks like. So don't see any big spikes like I'm about to show you, just a little blip and a bigger blip, and it's gone. Life on the internet, right? So from that perspective, and you're probably thinking, hey, this is a Splunk conf, where's the Splunk stuff? We're getting to it. So we use our global intelligence to sell all of your data to other, I'm kidding, that's not true. Pro <laughs> to proactively block threats, as I mentioned, speed up investigations, because again, we're gonna give you a ton of data at your fingertips, and this is just the investigate portion, right? This is just threat hunter, forward leaning, possibly response, but stay ahead of attacks. There are some really cool incidents where we were able to get a hold of algorithms uh, you guys familiar with DGA, domain generation algorithms, right? So those that have not dealt with those, think of an algorithm that could output 10,000 domains in 20 seconds, completely random. Anyone heard of the attack Thor's hammer? That's a great one, right? They use Twitter as their command and control and they would post tweets 
And the servers would go look at the tweet, and if it matched a particular string, then it would execute a particular command, and then it would move around. DGA is what's used to actually create those domains. So we got a hold of an algorithm that could create these DGA-generated domains. We were able to crack the algorithm, output the domains, and block them before they were ever in use. So we basically took an attacker's tool and broke it and blocked everything so it was useless. So we had to revamp it. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm doing stuff that's anything like that, I'm really lazy. So if you break my tool, I'm going to be like, man, I'm going to go do something else because that was a lot of work and now I'm bored. So that type of stuff really helps stay ahead of everything. Now, from the Splunk perspective, I want you to imagine all of that data enriching what you have from Splunk today. And Splunk is an incredibly powerful tool. You guys all know that. That's why you're here. But if you're, even if you're not using Umbrella, let's say that you're using an on-prem proxy. Maybe it's a blue coat. Maybe it's a force pointer, WebSense, you name it. And you're getting those logs into your SIM, as all good SOC analysts like to do. And you're correlating that with other information. And you see a ton of value in things like threat hunting and that forward-leaning posture that I was mentioning. You can actually utilize the Investigate API to enrich all of your logs with the data that we use to actually convict these domains. So up here, you see Umbrella DNS overall. So these are the queries that we've seen overall. The number of blocks, the percentage of blocks, and what they are. Like malware, crypto mining, potentially harmful. You can see gambling for different blocks over there. Over the last seven days, SWIG is Secure Web Gateway, which I won't go a lot into the solution. If you guys want to know more about that, we have a booth over. But we give you overall. But this is a very, very small shot of what I wanted to show you next. So let me get out of this presentation. If it will let me. There we go. All right. So this is what a typical log panel looks like from Activity Search. And there are a lot of guys out there that like to just look at this UI because it contains a lot of really interesting data. And you can do a whole bunch of stuff. But if you've already got a sim configured, it makes a whole lot more sense to take data from Investigate and utilize it in your dashboard. Now, one of those forward-leaning statements that I'm about to make is around this particular dashboard. Today, we can output everything via syslog. We can dump everything you've got into an S3 bucket, and you guys can ingest it into Splunk from S3 or use AWS CLI, pull all that stuff down to your local site and ingest it that way. We've already got a couple of apps out there. There are dashboards that are already set up. But this is one of those forward-leaning dashboards that actually utilizes a ton of API calls. So we're not just ingesting logs. We are actually using APIs to call out on a one-to-one -one line basis and say, give me enrichment data based on these particular domains that we're seeing. So from a dashboard perspective, you can see same type of stuff, domains blocked by threat type. This is a really, really interesting one from a Splunk perspective. Block domains with co-occurrences. You remember the co-occurrences from earlier. This is really, really great information for an investigation. And if I drill into that, it's going to give me a table of all the domains that have co-occurrences. Now, why is that important? Well, it's going to give you an A to Z of a lot of the domains that have been blocked with co-occurrences. I'm on the Wi-Fi, so it may take a second. But you can then very quickly craft your investigations around those things that have co-occurrences and do further investigations into the domains, finalizing results, into the domains that are also part of the co-occurrence. So you may be investigating pandorasong.com, but when it pops up in this particular chart, which is taking a good bit, and it may be my VPN's fault, but this particular chart will tell you, yeah, Pandora Song was there, but I also saw jmj.net. And that's an interesting one, too, because that's categorized as CNC, possibly, or maybe it's malware, or maybe it's another one. There we go. Eyesore, you guys probably can't read that very well, can you? A little better? OK. So the domains that were blocked, the co-occurrences, I do not have the status label configured. That is my bad. I am sorry. But that would be the category. And then, of course, the last queried time. So I'm looking at trucksimulator2.ru, speaking of Russians, and I'm seeing zero.gravatar.com and maxcdn bootstrapcdn.com either coming right before it or right after it. There's a very strong possibility I'm now going to drill into those and see if there are any co-occurrences there 
or what the categorization was, or maybe I'll actually do some type of adaptive response around this and kick off some type of investigation using my endpoint utilities with this intelligence. A lot of this stuff can be automated in Splunk. And with the acquisition of, uh, of Phantom, the orchestration of things like that just become much, much more powerful and much more useful. The other thing that you guys probably noticed, uh, is on this dashboard down to the bottom left, which I will have to go down to, you see things like incidents new, incidents in progress, incidents resolved. And of course, this is going to take a second to populate. But what this is is a holding place for integrations around orchestration with things like ServiceNow. So let's say you've already got an investigation started. You've got a ticket open. You could actually utilize APIs to uh, bring all of that information straight to this dashboard. And you can actually see how many incidents you've got in progress, drill into them right in Splunk, and start to get more and more information from that. This will come up in a second, and while it's coming up, let's pop over here real quick. Now, let's use Splunk.com, and I'll show you live what actually went on when I was building those slides, but we'll do it around Splunk, because Splunk's got a lot of interesting information, pretty popular domain, and yeah, my internet connection is killing it. Or I should say my VPN. Am I about to get the hook? So I clearly did not sacrifice enough to the demo gods this morning. One of those sheep are still in my backpack somewhere. <laughs> Come on. Hop back to the dashboard, still waiting. Wow, did it just go down? Huh? Still connected. Okay. How much time do I have left? They're saying stop. You're terrible. This is breaking right now. So I'm going to stop. We do have a booth right up front. You can see the blue Cisco right there. Any questions? If you want to come over and actually see this work when I'm not breaking it on my laptop, please do. Would love to chat with you. I've had a lot of great conversations. Thanks for your time, everybody.